Now, good evening to everyone who has joined this special Twitter Spaces tonight, where I will be in conversation with uh, Dr. Poppy Ramatuba. Dr. Ramatuba is the he Dr. Ramatuba is the health, health MEC for the South African province of Limpopo, which shares its border with Zimbabwe at Bay Bridge. Dr. Ramatuba has been in the news in the past week after a video of after a video of her talking to a Zimbabwean patient went viral. A lot of comments were made about the video, but eventually, Dr. Ramatuba's post. President Cyril Ramaphosa came to a defense and encouraged the comments she made to be part of a wider debate, both in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, about immigration and health delivery in those two countries. So tonight's conversation is part of that wider, which will be based on facts and the lived realities of both nations and nationalities. You can call it a family discussion if you want. Zimbabwe's health delivery system broke down a long time ago because of lack of investment and corruption. And because of that, a lot of uh, Zimbabweans find themselves going to neighboring countries to seek medical help because they cannot afford specialist uh, health care or private health care in Zimbabwe because of how expensive it is. 2,500 women die every year giving birth. And most of these women, they now uh, find themselves going to South Africa to seek help. And the closest province uh, of South Africa to Zimbabwe is Limpopo. So welcome, Dr. Popular Ratuba, to this discussion. Uh, good evening, Opwil, and good evening to all the participants. And indeed, we must appreciate the opportunity that we've been given to can be able to share with everyone uh, our side of the story. Because the story that is being told by the second person Usually, it's distort of facts. So we, we really appreciate this platform, especially that it is in this platform that we can see that a lot of uh, our brothers and sisters from Zimbabwe would uh, be able to interact with us uh, as compared to when we are only uh, focusing on the South African citizens. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bobby. I want to start by asking you about the state of healthcare in Lipopo. What is the state of state of healthcare in Lipopo at the moment? I think uh, uh, maybe w where I uh, really start is to indicate that uh, health is is one of those uh, basic human rights that uh, every country is supposed to provide to its citizen, and South Africa is no in uh, exception. And the challenges that are facing us as South Africans, uh, these are challenges uh, that uh, probably we would all agree that globally we do have challenges when it comes to, to the provision of health. Uh, when you look at the human resources, because health is run by highly skilled professionals. When you look at resources like the infrastructure for health, which is meant uh, for health itself, require its own uh, unique uh, infrastructure. Those will require a, a lot of investment uh, from government to be able to, to achieve that. If, if you remember during COVID-19, we had hard lockdowns. It doesn't matter which country it's. There is one sector which never went on a hard lockdown. And this is the health sector because there is in no way that you could work um, virtually. There is no way you can treat patients virtually. All other sectors, they, many of them can have alternatives to work from home. Uh, you don't necessarily need infrastructure, even some education. Learners, we saw them learning virtually, but you can't treat a patient virtually. You've got to be on the bad side of it. So infrastructure, human resources in health becomes very key that we need to invest. And and over the years, South Africa has been trying to, to make sure that, if I'm to come to, to, to your question, uh, that uh, historically we had a healthcare system which was divided uh, and it was there stipulated in the constitution prior 1994, where you are having a health system that has nine, uh, probably 19 uh, government departments. Um, or, and, and you will also have um, a, 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 the divide on racial lines. Let me give you an example. You had the Republic of Venda, which was a Bantu stand for Sensei Lipopo. You had the Republic of Gazankulu. You also have the Libua government. And you had a South African government within this. So you had four governments in this current province. If you go to even other provinces uh, which were Transvaal, equally they had all these governments within. You know, you will have Transkai, 
you will have Siskai, you will have Wuputatswana. So when you add of the, all of them, they will give you a huge number. So 1994 breakthrough made it possible for us to merge all these, like in, in Limpopo now, these four governments made one uh, Limpopo Department of Health. So in Lu, you also have the Libua government and you had a South African government government within this. So you had four governments in this current province. If you go to even other provinces uh, which were Transvaal, equally they had all these governments within, you know, you will have Transkai, you will have Siskai, you will have Wuputatswana. So when you add of the, all of them, they will give you a huge number. So 1994 breakthrough made it possible for us to merge all these, like in, in Limpopo now, these four governments made one uh, Limpopo Department of Health. So in the country, we had one uh, national department of health supported by its nine provinces. So meaning we are no longer, not a federal state, we are one country with nine provinces. Now, what is the challenge that it, we saw post-94? Pre-94, the divide was based on your language, your culture, your, your, your color of the skin. But post-94, what we begin to see, it has become a class struggle where you are divided based on those that have, that can afford, uh, those that cannot afford. Uh, those that afford in the country, they form uh, 14%. Uh, in South Africa, 14% of the population can afford private health care, whereas 86% of the population, it's ended on the public health. Now, now let me narrow it down to the, the province that we are here to talk about. In Limpopo, we then have five point estimation of around 5.7 million people. Of those, 91% it's dependent on the state and only 9% can afford private health care. Now that tells you that whatever budget we have, already it is overburdened by the majority of the citizen. That is where the entity is. How is South African government responding to these challenges? Because pre-94, it was legislated, it was whatever. Post-94, private health care and public health care are not legislated. People just come out of the grid of the capitalists that you would have those with money, acquiring private hospitals, building private hospitals, which it's over-resourced with a, a few patients, but have got a lot of staff and, and on a lot of, of resources. All the first-class equipment, they're there. The public health on the other side, saving 91%. It's, there's a lot of competition for, with many people with a high burden of disease. We understand that uh, poverty, being in the rural area, the risk of you having quite a number of huge burden of disease. Uh, the lower level of education, when you compare with those who are in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the private healthcare, they are highly more educated and, and, and chances of them to acquire certain disease are very limited. When you look, for, for example, if you look at maternal death, the reason you have more death rates in the poor and uh, uh, where the, the, or the low, low socioeconomic communities or the, the population that is not educated, it, it's, it's mainly if one of those risk factors that you see that even access to antenatal uh, clinics will not be the same as when you're in the private sector, when you're in public, uh, all these long queues, uh, the time, the availability of medicine and all that. So South African, that is why you, you might have heard we're responding with what we call national health insurance, where we are going to have all the pool of all the funds of health to be managed by one uh, insurance. And, and in that, the, the, the providers will purchase that. So those who have, like me, who is a professional and working, I will contribute to the medical insurance through tax. But those who are uh, from a, a, a poor background or when you look at their economic classifications to be low, they will not be contributing like I do. They will be subsidized by what I do. So we are on that stage to try to address these resources that are skewed towards the 9 instead of them to be skewed towards the 91%. So, so where we are now, those are the major challenges because this uh, imbalances in terms of the funding has resulted in, you'll find that the public health care, it's overburdened with the, with the patient 
it's under-resourced in terms of equipment, in terms of human resources. So that is why uh, you, you see uh, w w private, when you go there, because you are also paying a lot of money there, the, the attitude of the staff there, because the reality is that if I'm a physician and I'm seeing 200 patients and somebody there is a physician is seeing 10 patients, my attitude towards 199 patients will never be the same as the one uh, towards the number nine patient. And also when it comes to uh, the, the treatment that they will receive these patients will not be the same. Hence, you will find there is poor quality in the public sector and uh, appear to be a good quality in the private because they are dealing with small volumes. So we are in the process of addressing some of those challenges that involves the, the funding. So th this this sounds like a, a problem of uh, underfunding of the health delivery system. So in 2001, uh, African heads of states met in Abuja and they agreed that 15 percent of the uh, of every country's uh, national budget should go towards health. How much are you investing towards uh, health as a country in terms of your budget percentage? I just I just need to 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 verify what is the the latest because the the, the there was trying to be improvement at at some stage we were at eight percent but the problem is it's not how much it's being put on the funding uh, how much of our gdp do we put on the funding of the health the the more main problem here is that how much of that that which is being put it's going to the public vis-a-vis -vis going to the private and we have of course seen uh, in the recent past years, the disinvestment on the public health, and that's not a, a problem that is unique to South Africa. Hence, you have seen that even at the United Nations level, the universal health care coverage has been resolved as we, we uh, heads of state, having to look at that. And, and for that, I must recommend uh, our government because the commitment and, and, and that has, it's being looked at, and we believe that the universal health care coverage will be achieved through the national health insurance. So to what extent, um, you're surrounded by, by many countries. Uh, you have uh, Swaziland, you have Lesotho, you have Namibia, you have Mozambique, you have uh, Zimbabwe, you have Botswana. Uh, uh, to what extent has the influx of uh, uh, illegal immigrants affected this? Because the issue that has sparked this whole discussion is about uh, illegal immigrants coming into your country and specifically into Limpopo, uh, seeking medical health, and there is now a problem where locals are having to fight with uh, um, their, their foreign brothers and sisters for access to medical help. To, to, to what extent has this been a, caused the problem? I, I think, uh, uh, well, towards addressing uh, these imbalances that have been created, and while we are struggling to say we need to correct the funding model, that has been used uh, since 1994, uh, post-democracy. We then found another major challenge, which is facing the very uh, same overburdened public health and under-resourced, being our illegal immigrants. And, and for instance, uh, when one was interacting with a patient, uh, because sometimes you assess the level of, of literacy of a patient, and then you want to go to that patient and explain some of these things uh, because you can see this person can be able to understand what you're talking about so that they don't go out and say, but South Africans are unfair, South Africans are that. Now, now one of those explanations was just to simplify that you have got stats SA or census here where go around counting us and be able to come and tell you that Limpopo, you've got so many pe pe population and uh, presenting those statistics to the national treasury which will then look at its fiscals and then allocate budgets based on the, 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 the data that is available. And, and, and our province, it's not the uh, same as Gauteng or, or KZN or Eastern Cape in terms of uh, the citizens. We, we are lower, lower than them. Then the budget will talk to those uh, 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 legal or, or people who are in the country uh, documented. Let, let's use the word documented and it will give you uh, the understanding to say how many citizens do you have and how many documented citizens you have now you are given this particular budget to address that 
And already with the budget that you are given, you are already complaining that this budget, it, it doesn't meet the, the demands. Already I've shared with you the broader challenge of funding of healthcare in the country. So on top of it, you are hard to hit as the public sector because the, the budget that you are then given, it's based on the population that is available. And the undocumented, uh, when they enter the country, they will never be accepted in the private healthcare. That we know is a fact. Because even South Africans, when I am sick like this, if I go to the private healthcare, even if they are the ones who are now raising the issue that Section 27 uh, talks about access to emergency healthcare, we, we, we don't see that in practice in the private sector to say, even if it's a South African citizen involved in an emergency a, 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 a motor vehicle or in labor, you go to that facility, you either must put up front the money that you have, or secondly, if you, you, you have a medical insurance, they must be able to prove that there is authorization. You know, this day there is even pre-authorization before they touch you. So, but then when it comes uh, to the state, we, we do our things uh, uh, differently. Uh, what we, we, we want to also put it up front it's that people must understand, and, and I think we can all agree, and this is also applied to us South Africans, is that everyone must pay services. There, there are two categories. You have got a primary health care where it's free at, at the point of, of entry, which is the primary health care, where you go to your clinics, you get immunization for your children, you do your antenatal, and even deliveries at the clinics. You get your vaccines. We are not we are not paying at that level. It's free primary health care services. It's funded by the state. When you move to the hospital level, which is where people do not really are failing to understand. When you get to the hospital, you must pay because you are now entering a secondary and a tertiary services. And and how does the system work for you to pay? When it's, it's me, a, 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 a Popira Matuba, because I am at a certain economic class, when I arrive there, I go through a means test. And I'm told you are at H3, meaning you are earning above 72,000 per annum, or you, you've got a medical insurance. Then you will cover full payment. Or they will say you are what we call H2, meaning you are earning... Uh, up just above 35,000 but below 72,000 we, we're going to make you a, to pay a discounted fee when you are now below age uh, 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 that, that you are earning 5,000 you are age one and then you will also pay a, a, a minimum discounted fee then but when you are age zero this is where the problem is when you are age zero from a, a, a primary level up until tertiary services in academic center up to central and academic hospitals. You don't pay when you are H0 because you should be able to prove that you are unemployed. And how do you prove that you are unemployed? You either bring an affidavit from the police where you, it will be a sworn one, or you are going to go to, uh, if you are getting a grant, uh, pensioners for the, for the uh, social security, you must prove using a, a, a receipt that you earn that amount. And then you will then be able to be assisted without paying. So this means test function properly for all the citizens and for all those who are documented. Now the challenge becomes when you are not documented, uh, this is where the overburdening of the system comes in. You are not documented some of, of, of the in, 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 in undocumented foreign nationals do not even bring an identification document. Maybe your own ID uh, or passport, they don't even have those documents. Now, we, will, we do help assist them, but we are unable to build them or to classify them. This has got its own repercussion because when the Auditor General audit us, and we are to them, uh, we, this, we, can't, we can't collect this revenue. We must prove why this person cannot pay. 
as it is for now, we are owing or we are being owed by patients more than 500 million rands, which must be written off. Since my appointment as an MEC, I have already made a requisition of writing off of more than a billion rand of patient owing fees. Now, when, when you ask a, a treasury to, to, to write off your, those debts, they want to see the proof. Was it a pregnant woman? Was it a, somebody who was a pensioner? Was this person unemployed? So undocumented immigrants do not go, won't go to the police to get that affidavit because they're afraid they might be arrested. Now, what they do, they come in and give us false information, uh, some of them. When they give us the false name, we, upon discharge, when we try to collect this uh, debt uh, or, or recover the debt, you find that the information they've given us, the address, nothing works, nothing functions. So already as I speak, our National Treasury appointed a team of, of some service provider to help us with the collecting of this uh, uh, debt. We real, they were sharing with us that only 10% of the five, 500 million, they do have a potential to can trace. 5% they've already traced. The remaining 9%, which is 450 million, it must be written off. Mind you, the budget that we get, there is a portion that is attached to revenue collection. I've already forfeited that. Because of the challenges we're facing with COVID and that, we receive a budget cut of 3, 3 billion as a province. Now, I'm giving you this financial complication so that we, we must understand and appreciate that when we come to the province and refuse to pay and also our neighboring countries refuse to pay when we appeal to them to say embassies please reimburse these services were consumed by your citizens remember i know of our constitution it says health is a basic human right i want to believe that any country must take health as a basic human right. And I think COVID-19 taught the global community that. So if a nation is not able to provide the health care to its citizens, the best they can do is to reimburse those that are doing uh, uh, that particular work on their behalf. Because human beings are human beings. Life is life. When the healthcare workers uh, sees you they see a patient. They don't see the nationality. That's a fact. It will be only us who are policymakers who are supposed to help the healthcare workers to collect this revenue so that we can continue to render these services. We have recently, I was with a forensic pathologist trying to do an analysis of all the unidentified or unclaimed corpses. Just for forensic only, we have already buried as a country 349 unclaimed bodies, unidentified. Because these are the people have not included those who died of medical conditions in our hospitals. These are the people who come and give us false information and they passed on in our uh, uh, care. We are unable to trace their families and their next of kin. And you'll find that the corpses can stay in our mortuary for more than six to 12 months. And from there, they must write to me. For instance, in Chirizini, we just disposed uh, corpses last uh, in December. But I'm told now we already have another 44, which the process now, the procedure says, I must go to the municipality and, and, and buy the graves, go and buy the coffins and come and buy it. This is not the money that when Treasury allocates, we look into that. So, so it has put a, a strain even on our forensic uh, services, such that you will see that even the, the post-mortem turnaround time has become even slow. The mortuary, at some stage, you might have read headlines to mortuaries are overflowing. There was a case where in a patient died around at, 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 at 12 midnight. The procedure now, because we no longer have those uh, 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 
our mortuaries are full by the unidentified bodies. Then what happens is when you, you die, we must call your family if you are a local to bring an undertaker at 12 midnight to come and collect your corpse to go and, and, and put in the private undertaker. Now, when the person died at two, and we know that's the time where most of the people died at, at midnight, that was my experience. Most of the children are born uh, at night and towards the early hours. So, so life and death, it's, it's around uh, midnight towards the early hours. Now, we, we, our nurses get traumatized by having to leave that corpse until morning when the family comes to claim. And this is a corpse, there was that a story for at Philadelphia Hospital. The corpse had sleep with other fellow patients. Now that is the unhuman part of it where you, we are being subjected by this current uh, system to say, when the staff leave a corpse that has been wrapped to wait for the family to come because there's no any other place to go. What about the emotional uh, 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 challenges that will face the fellow patients who are alive and they must be sitting to say it can be me they then begin to lose confidence and stress develop and even the treatment will not work on them so so that is why we're saying if we can get cooperation uh, from our neighbors and and you rightfully put it up well to say people might think we are attacking Zimbabwean national and i need to clarify this from up front as Limpopo, you have said, we can't change the fact that we share the geographic location and our border post with Zimbabwe. As such, that is why when you talk about illegal immigrants, every second patient would be coming from Zimbabwe because we are there. For them, if they need health care, if a woman is pregnant and she wants to deliver her baby safely, she will have to cross the border to come to the province and which will be Limpopo. And that's why you hear Musina Hospital. It's one of those hospitals that is uh, really hard to hit, followed by your Chirizini, your Silom. These are some of the hospitals on N1, your Louis Richard Hospital, your Mutogwa, on your N1. Because sometimes when they are making their, their way to Gauteng and, and, and other, Cape, uh, uh, other provinces, they, they might fall sick and they will have to be assisted there. So, so all we, we would want to, to raise here is that the, the challenges that is being felt by the system it had its own challenges that it was trying to address. But these challenges uh, are not the, the, the results of us trying to turn around the system are not becoming visible because we have to carry the burden of undocumented foreign nationals, which their states do not really want to come on board and assist us. So, so you go to another province like Mpumalang, it will be a different story. They will not be talking about Zimbabwean nationals. Perhaps you'll hear the, the other uh, nations complaining that Bumalanga is attacking us. If you go to Free State, they'll be talking about Lesotho. They will think they're attacking, at, attacking us. So what we're simply saying is that South African healthcare system cannot, and it will become impossible for it to carry the entire uh, continent in terms of the healthcare system or even SADC, because we also equally have the Pakistan nationals. We also have the Somalian nationals. They're there and we are, they are undocumented. We are having to deal with them, providing healthcare for them. If, if they can't pay as individuals, their state, I still strongly believe, should be able to meet us halfway. Now, uh, Dr. You spoke about, in, in the latest video, you spoke about how uh, you're going to send a bill uh, to President Mnangagwa's government. Is this something that you were saying out of frustration or something that is on the cards that you actually want to do? Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Well, you see, what I was saying there, and 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 this is one of those uh, clips that people take take, uh, you know, and they will be going all over to take some even old clips and 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 circulate. What I need to indicate uh, here was was to say, our former minister of health, Dr. Aaron Swale, probably that's why you see him very passionately working around the clock to try to deal with this whole issue 
of the border post management. Because at that time, I remember when I invited to come to Musina, what he saw there, it was shocking for him. And, and we started a process of uh, him leading us, getting uh, countries, governments to come on board and settle some of the bills. I remember the former MEC of Houting, Dr. Ram Khupakwe. She was also our deputy minister. There was a time where in, they've also sent some of these bills to, to the embassies or different governments to pay. We have not received that, that joy of, of getting the support. So, so this cry, it's not necessarily an attack on the uh, Zimbabweans, but it's, it's simple to say how I wish a, a state or government can come on board and be able to assist in trying to make sure that their uh, citizens are also catered for. If we can't cater on the other side and we think South Africa should assist, we should formalize it and South Africa must be able to send the bill and then Zimbabwe or Mozambique or any country must be able to pay and say, we appreciate that the fact that you looked after our citizens, our citizens in terms of your ministers cannot afford. Here you, we are going to pay. So, so this is what we are saying. We are not going to stop on this. While at the provincial level, I do not have uh, probably the powers to can reinforce. But what I like about this thing, it doesn't matter at what corner you are. You might be at a corner of seeing Dr. Ramatuba as a monster. You might be at a corner where you see Dr. Ramatuba as a messiah. You might be at a corner where you see Dr. Ramatuba as unreasonable. But the reality of the matter is that for the first time, we've been able to come and see this matter receiving attention at the highest offices. Because all along, we will talk in boardrooms, but things would not necessarily be happening. So, so we really appreciate this frankness and openness. The, the, for me, I believe the time had to come where we stop, and it's now. We must stop sugarcoating things and start dealing with issues. We are talking about lives, lives of innocent people, whether they are Zimbabwean nationals or South Africans, but these are lives. And I have got a, a constitutional res obligations and responsibility to make sure that South African citizens, the Limpopo ones, are provided with healthcare. And unfortunately, when the buck stops with me, when a patient die because they were waiting for an operation, when a woman is being progressed, looking, sitting on the chair because there's no bed in maternity ward, that becomes a litigation on me. Our Human Rights Commission is always on my office to complain about this patient was not treated fairly. But when you raise all these other things that are challenges to say, can you help us to deal with this? We don't see people coming on board to help us to deal with this. But we see people being very harsh in judging us. When the medical legal negligence, the contingency liability bill is at 14.7 billion in this province. If I'm to pay the entire bill, I'll close shop, there won't be any department to run. When it's up there, the blame is on that nurse it's on that doctor, it's on that x-ray, it's on that infrastructure, it's on, on the Department of Health, it's on the MEC for Health. No one wants to look at all these other factors to say, if this norm says an ICU nurse must be allocated one patient, and then we then alloc allocate four or three uh, uh, patients to one uh, ICU nurse without even proper resources. Because why I'm saying this is putting a strain on us, we are attending to patients that we are not funded for them. Therefore, one nurse is subjected to look at much more patients. Then mistakes will happen. Because mistakes will happen for those who are working under pressure, being under resource for long hours. So, so, so we, 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 we are saying we want to see the government playing their part and assisting us in be able to pay for their own citizens. So you have spoken about the issue of um, 
foreigners, they may be Zimbabwean or Mozambican, and indeed you mentioned Pakistani and Somalians. Uh, so there's a problem of immigration. People in maybe illegally, and there's a problem that they access uh, the hospital uh, and they are not budgeted for. And there's a possibility that they may die in that hospital and you still need to pick that bill. That to me shows a, a, a crisis taking place. But what has the ANC done and what has the government of South Africa done to deal with the root cause of this problem? Because we all know that if health systems were working in all these countries, there will be no need for someone to come to Dr. Ramatupa's hospital. Uh, we will all be coming to South Africa as tourists going to camp in Durban and not overloading these hospitals. If you engage the government of Zimbabwe, for instance, and what have they said? I, I, I wish one day as, as Africans, uh, I will be driving like I used to do when I was young. Uh, when we were kids, we will go to visit Victoria Falls through school trips. The people of Zimbabwe will come and visit Puga National Park, in Mapungubye, and, and, and we share that. And, and we, we live as, as one happy family in the continent. And, 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 and this is the failure of our government. And, and I I'm, I'm, I'm know I'll be in trouble for saying this. The failure of our government to deal with the border management uh, post, the, to deal with the whole inten uh, uh, crisis that faces immigration, has resulted in, unfortunately, is the working class that are fighting each other now. I must say, it is not me who is now on tweet, uh, tweeting about how I feel. It is that poor rural women from Hachikunda Marema who want to deliver in a facility and found that it's full. And when she looks, she, she would say the people in the room are speaking a different language and de develop, they start to develop attitude towards our own uh, African brothers and sisters. Because this is what we are creating as the leadership. We are creating a situation wherein we are comfortable in our own uh, a, 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 a situation. When we need health care, we will go to Morningside and we'll go to Park Lane. But here are the people who do not have any other option. They must fight. Already in the beginning, I said 91% are dependent on this public. Now, even the other ones who come from the they are undocumented, they come and overcrowd the very same system. So, so we who created this uh, must do something. I want to believe that, you know, the, the approach that Minister Mtualedi came up with. Uh, hence, I, I kept in one of the debates at our uh, uh, assembly, provincial assembly, a uh, provincial legislature, was people think we are only raising these things now. We've been raising these things at proper forum. At the legislature, I once raised this, and in the indicator, we we need to see to be seen to be supporting the work that the home affairs currently is doing and is embarking on, because if we do that, we will be able to harmonise. But also, it doesn't end there. Uh, government, we must be responsible when we are leading the people, and we have got to do everything we can to resolve some of the uh, minor issues that you hear. When you see. Some of the doctors, uh, colleagues will send me messages. Both the doctors who are currently working in Zimbabwe and some who are working in the country to say, do you even have an understanding what we are going through that side? That some of us uh, do not have gloves. Uh, we, 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 our maternity is in shambles. So uh, do not uh, be surprised why this is happening. Now, the, the, the people of Zimbabwe, should also work with their government to deal with these problems and resolve these problems. Be because as the, the nations, as citizens, we do not take interest and say we have an alternative. When I'm sick, I'll cross the border and go to South Africa. They will help me. South Africa also health system will crumble and collapse and we won't have anywhere to go. So we, 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 as Africans, I strongly believe we can work on fixing uh, the problem. So at the level of uh, the Minister of Health, uh, uh, because I indicated earlier, we are not a federal system. All our policies and guidelines are done in Pretoria. So, so the Minister of Health, those of you who might have watched uh, this on SABC, he was on, in one hospital today. 
and he was also expressing the frustrations of 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 this uh, undocumented and the pressure they are putting on the South African healthcare system. So so we are hoping that this matter has received the attention that it's supposed to, and as uh, uh, solutions, you will see them coming on board. And at that level of deco, at the level of the ministers. It's not only one department. This is a department of home affairs, department of health, department DECO, um, a treasury, national treasury, and also South African police services. This department must come together and be able to lead us as the two uh, 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 countries, not only the two, by the way, but including even other SADC regions at, at our region and fix these things at our region and have a region that we can be proud of. And like you said, we can be able to know that we will be visiting each other as neighbors and marry for each other and, and not be calling each other's name because this is what now we have resorted into. So, so we don't want that. But then the buck stops with those who are in leadership who are leading us. So some people think, are you so personal against our president? There is nothing personal about uh, him this is just a figure of speech to say you are talking, uh, when you talk about the Limpopo health, people, when they go to clinics and they don't find medicine, I'm telling you, they will tell you, Poppy, what is it that she's doing? Poppy this, Poppy that. I'm not the one who's supplying medicine, but the figure of speech will, will make them to talk about me because I am given the responsibility to look after the health of the people of Limpopo. When some things don't go right, People speak about President Ramaphosa, that he's not doing this and that. So even any nation, for instance, will refer to, to the, 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 the Zimbabwean government, will speak about President Munangab. We will not speak about ordinary people there. So there's nothing uh, personal. And, and this was an old uh, a, a video, which actually it was taken when one was trying to comfort uh, the nurses who were saying, we are burnt out. And, and we started, oh, but... I remember saying, when it comes to pregnant women and their unborn baby, I am going to protect them with a drop of blood because it doesn't matter whether that child is which nationality or where they are innocent. They must never suffer for the mistakes that we who are in leadership have committed. So, so we would not want a such situation. So in order to make the, the staff that was there to feel uh, that indeed, uh, we, we we need to sometimes you need to use some of the figure of speech when you talk like that so so um dr ramatuba do you accept that there's been a failure of leadership in the region because this crisis as you rightly said is caused by leadership do you accept that there's been failure of leadership in the region uh, with the risk of career limiting uh, I, I must indicate that we who are elected by the people have not done much uh, in trying to make sure that we prevent what is happening and we currently resolve what is continuously happening. I strongly believe that those of us who are in leadership can still do much more to be able to reverse the situation and avert the catastrophe that might happen should we not act now. No, thank you so much. I hope that the career will not be limited. <laughs> um, so I want to move to the original video that triggered this whole debate. Uh, we saw two minutes of it. Obviously, something happened before in the video was filmed and something happened after it was filmed. Can you explain um, what happened on that day? I think as, as a province, as I've already indicated, we, we are rural and therefore to attract settlers and certain specialities. It is very difficult as compared to provinces like Gauteng, Western Cape and the parts of KwaZulu Natal, mainly the, the Teben Metro. Now, for you to get a specialist to come and work in Limpopo, it's not easy. That is why our surgical backlogs were very high. Now, we, we had to be innovative. And we came up with a project which referred to as Rural Healthcare Matters, referring to the rural province. What happens with this Rural Healthcare Matters? On a monthly basis, I, we move with a team of specialists from one district to another. We've got five districts or regions in the province. Now, we spend a week there with specialists 
we do clear the surgical backlog that is there and then we move to the next uh, district now where do we get this specialist uh, for what we do uh, i would uh, personally go and and target uh, specialists who are outside the province whom i know they've got roots with limpop i'll go and speak to professor steve machiza he's the head of orthopedics in first stage professor ss kolele he's at smu uh, we also have got Prof. Shiflaro, also that is surgeon there, and there are many others. Some will come from as as far as Lady Smith. Uh, some are not necessarily coming from Lipopo, but uh, they will hear when we say we've got um, Elijima. Elijima is like a project. It's like coming together to work. You know, in the past, when you 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 had the fields to plow, you will call all the, the villagers. They will agree to say, let's start with this field. Let's move to the second one, and that. So we, we call it in that way. And then they will come. And, and, and you must note that they are not coming. They are coming at no cost for, for us. What we probably will do is to provide medical transport and what. Now, since we started this project, we have already operated more than 4,000. This, this month we were getting... And when I, we went to do an analysis to say how far with, are we with the surgical backlog, we realized that we seem to be chasing our tail. The numbers are still high, but there's a lot of work that is being done. We start to our investigation. Then, then the very same clinicians come to me and say, you know, MEC, we came here to assist you. And we have got ethical obligations to operate any patient you book for us. But the patients that you are booking for us are actually undocumented uh, immigrants, foreign nationals. How do you answer that? We, we are not winning on this. These are not, elect when I say when, uh, elective operations, these are elective, I mean an operation that you plan. These are patients who have got keloids. And when they have their keloids, for instance, they, 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 there was a young boy who had to stop going to school because they were calling him a witch because he's got all these calories. And, and we had to make intervention and get the plastic and reconstruct, reconstructive surgeon during our, our rural health matters to operate. And the young men now went back to school. These are your lipomas uh, that, that we need to also operate on. Um, some, of course, majority of those cases becomes our orthopedics which could be as a result of trauma that would have happened some ago and the person need to be operated. Now, now, the problem here was that we had this time around, we were at Waterbeck and we were trying to look at, uh, because we do go and interact with the patients. And the team has explained to us, you know, some of these patients are not even uh, documented. And, and that's where this comes from to say, look, if you are not documented, and I could hear you can articulate where, do you know the impact that you are you, you you're causing here? It's not like somebody came with severe uh, a pain, somebody who's seriously sick. These are the patients whom in the private hospital they take you during the day, operate you, and discharge you. It's a day of operation to some, and 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 some of these orthopedic cases. Are costing us up to two hundred thousand each, some up to one fifty thousand, and we are not able to recoup the money. So this is what was happening. To say we explain to the patient so that they understand, because the problem is when you don't also explain to the patient, they are still going to go back and still bring others here. And unfortunately, this is where the clash between the locals and the foreign nationals gets. Because for us, when we were at Chirizini, the day we did, uh, they operated 26 uh, orthopedics where they were fixing 26 bones. 19 of them were foreign nationals. There was a patient who was out of the 26. Uh, there was a patient who was lying there waiting. He's the patient who calls me and complains to say, I've been here, all these people that you have operated before me, I can hear they are not coming from the count. Where will I get the operation? 
You see, that is where the conflict is going to start. If we do not handle this carefully, then we will start to say some are uh, don't like others, others like uh, the others, and 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 which will not be, be be correct because this is not an emergency. Especially when this patient was telling us, I was involved in an accident somewhere in Harare. I was just told by my brother to say, just go to South Africa, arrive in Musina. They'll put it in an ambulance. You'll go to Chilizin. There is a, a doctor Kopi who's coming there who is going to bring the doctors. They will operate you. Uh, if I'm to share with you now, after the water bag, we issue a statement congratulating the 491 cases that were done. And we said our next stop is in Mupani district. We are going to go to Mupani and do all this uh, elective operation by all these professors who are volunteering. You won't believe that today as we speak, the hospital, which is a regional hospital in Litaba, the, the clinical manager was sharing with me the, his frustration and the CEO. They've already admitted 11 foreign nations in the orthopedic ward. It's now full. <laughs> now, many, those South Africans who have been on the waiting list, they will wait for the correct date of the 26th. By the time when they arrive, the wards are full. And, and also, we, we need to, to preach the spirit of uh, patriotism amongst our staff starting with the home affairs to say when you see somebody is not an emergency it's coming for health and you allow them to pay their way into the country when they get to the hospital whether they pay their way into getting the fine jumping the queue but when we ask them to pay the fees after treatment uh, it's something that they would not want to see happening so so this is what really happened we, we were doing part of patient education and patient information because this is not a patient who was acutely ill as it's being uh, uh, said, who was lying in the bed. The patient actually was even discharged. What we were waiting for was for the transport to take her. And, and this is why this conversation had to, 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 to happen, to share with the patient our own uh, uh, challenges and what the impact of them being undocumented will. We, we can blame, maybe, people should also reason it this way. When the MEC speaks to a patient who has long been operated and has been discharged, is waiting to go home, she's trying to share information so that this patient, when he, she goes home, she should be able to say to their brothers and sisters, what we are doing by going illegally to South Africa and occupy the space, a uh, front space illegally, so it's gonna destroy the relation, remaining relationship that is there between the locals of South Africa and us. They are equally in need, in dire need of healthcare services like we do. It's unlike when I want to give birth. It's an emergency. It's unlike when I got an accident. But for me to leave my country with an elective operation, a planned one, it is not fair to the South Africans, locals, who, by the way, do not have any other option except that pu public health. When people attack me when I say I speak for the 91%, it's because they don't have any other option. If we don't provide health care for them, there's no any other place that they will go and will get an operation done. Now, um... Uh, Dr. Ramatuba, you are a senior member of the African National Congress, which is the ruling party in South Africa. Um, is there any discussion taking place in your political party about how to deal with this problem? Because this has been ongoing for a long time and nothing has been done. In 2020, I remember when I was in prison, um, the, 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 the South African president sent a delegation to deal with the crisis that came out of our imprisonment. And the ruling party in Zimbabwe said that Zimbabwe is not uh, the 10th province of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, I remember that President Robert Mugabe insulted um, former minister Lee Zulu, called a prostitute, and the ANC did nothing about this. As you rightly said, we, we, we end up with a situation where the poor are fighting each other. But is there any discussion among the political elites of Africa to deal with their counterparts in Zimbabwe so that this issue can be resolved. Borders can be erected, but people will still find ways of coming in. 
But the best solution to deal with this issue is to deal with it at leadership level. Is there any discussion that is taking place with your counterparts in Zimbabwe? I'm asking you this not as the MEC of Limpopo, but as a senior member of the African National uh, Congress, as a senior leader of the African National Congress. I think of will I'm a, I'm a provincial leader, yes, of the African National Congress, and uh, I can influence the branches of the ANC in the province and the provincial general council. If you go and look at our resolution at the range conference, which was held uh, early June, we resolve on this matter as Limpopo uh, what needs to be done. Actually, we re emphasize the resolution that was taken in Lazarek in 2017 on the, the, the mandate and the, 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 the which the African National Congress had given to National Treasury, National Department of Health, all those departments that I've mentioned, to start working on this matter. We, we then also subsequently had our Provincial General Council uh, as a preparation of the National Policy Conference, which was just held also in July this year. The resolutions in that policy conference is very clear on what needs to be done. I think to those who feel that uh, I was probably out of order, the reality of the matter I was even, uh, what I was saying there, uh, it's, it's, it's that which is there even in the region. The, the issue is that how do we then reinforce the implementation of those resolutions? And, and the National Executive Committee of the ANC, I can tell you they're busy uh, dealing with this matter because we, we, we have seen what happens uh, not so long ago, when, when eight eight women gang raped by by illegal uh, foreign uh, nationals, gang raped uh, to an extent that one woman was subjected to be raped by ten. As a as a clinician, as a medical doctor, when I read that, uh, for me it took me back when I was still uh, practicing, and when you would have to to reconstruct the the perineum of women, which would be torn apart by a rapist, because you would not wish for those things to happen. Some of those girls were, were virgins when this happened to them. So, so the, the issue, it's getting completely uh, out of hand. And, and my belief is that the, the ANC is actually the med. Things might have happened in the past and we might not have been seen as if we were very serious in addressing this matter. But even from a provincial point of view, I can tell you every single member of the ANC wants to see this matter being resolved. I can tell you every single member in that NEC is committed to get this to be done. We are just hoping that the implementation part of it and also, yes, looking at all the other root causes that at my level, it, I will not be able to uh, uh, be able to deal with that, you know. That, that's not a provincial matter. This is the national matters which um, NEC has got its own secretaries for international relations, a secretary for uh, foreign affairs, secretaries for all those. They are there who politically, I believe, are, are working hard to try to make sure we resolve this. Uh, you, you know, it's for the first time that you will uh, uh, see as, as journalists that the people of this country get united when it comes to this issue. It is not because of health matters. It's because each and every citizen, I've seen there are many publications which try to say, instead of dealing with the matter, you know, let's put, and I always say to journalists, you have made a point that Dr. Ramatuba spoke to the patient and whatever. Some of you even said you are submitting to the health professional cancer. You have made that point and we have accepted and, and let the council be given space to deal with the med. And if there's any ethical breach, let the council deal with that med. That issue must be tagged and be closed. You can't keep on repeating it every uh, uh, one hour. We have to deal with the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room here is that South all of all of them are worried. Actually, majority of them are worried by the current situation. Whenever you put that article, they, they come in uh, God blessing at you. South Africans usually when a, a, a government officials is being lambasted on the media, they will definitely support that journalist. But I don't know why our journalists can't see that this time around, the people, it's not because of the health matters. Hopefully it's because when you go to Wembe district, 
my colleague, the MEC for Social Development, just did an analysis. More uh, social grants are paid in Vembe district than any other, uh, and also followed by Mupan. And when they do an analysis, there are people who just come in to get the, the grant and go that side. You know, those are the things that somebody who is sitting at home not working, he thinks his job is taken by an illegal immigrant, even if it's not true. So that's why I'm saying this time around, where I'm sitting, I want to believe that uh, all of us would be able to find solutions because it's affecting all of us, all sectors, not just the health. And it's unfortunate that the people who feel the brand and the people who, who we are making to fight each other, it's not those of us who can afford, it's the poor ones. And people get angry when I, when I raise these things to say, even those governments outside, they do pay for their own uh, uh, families in facilities like money side. Because you know, when it comes to health, if we don't intervene when you are sick now, the mistakes that will happen can be corrected. If that woman, that girl who comes with a head on perineum, and I start to question where I do, what is happening, uh, give the bill from uh, your president, let me give me the bill, let them pay. By the time the, the head will hit the ground and that baby will be died and that baby won't come back. If the pregnant woman start PPHing and pouring, she's just going to die and nothing will come to reverse. So that is why this time around, because the anger is on health matters, you can see the sensitivity of the matter that is involved. But we, we, we want to believe that this is the time where debate as it is, irritating as it is, a feeling you, can, you might be feeling that uh, this woman has been a devilish on this matter. But the reality is that we are saying, even to the media space, media houses, instead of us to be focusing on how, when, what, who said what, that process must be closed and focus on getting the solution of the elephant in the room. We've got to get these things resolved. No matter what we want, the way forward is we can't have an option but to resolve this matter. And those with that responsibility and mandate to resolve, we need to give them support and space to spend their sleepless night on resolving this matter. No, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Poppy Ramatuba. I, I, I've got I've, I've got a lot more questions, but we won't finish. We can <laughs> we'll end up going uh, after twelve midnight. So what I want to do is to allow my sister, um, who is the uh, head of foreign news at SABC, Sophie, to just ask you a few questions. And after that, I'll bring the head of uh, public diplomacy for the South African government, uh, Brother Clayston Monyela, and, and he can answer the questions to do with the broader political issues. We'll open it up and you will answer the, the, the questions. Uh, so, Sophie, over to you. Uh, Sophie, can you hear me? Your microphone is is off. Yes, yes go ahead, thank Sophie. you so much. Sorry. Um, uh, Poppy, um, uh, it's a pleasure talking to you. When I went to Limpopo, I think uh, during the repatriation of South Africans who were trapped in Wuhan, I saw a woman, a young woman, who was committed to serve South Africa and the continent at a very difficult time when even some of the provinces in this country didn't even want to accept their own children who were stuck in Wuhan and majority were not from Limpopo. Based on your ethical uh, approach to your profession as a doctor. So my starting point will be, is it difficult at this moment where we have this platform just to apologize to that uh, patient or those patients where your message or your approach was misconstrued. That's the starting point. I want to hear that apology. Two, the problems of leadership in the SADC region. Is it not time, here I'm talking to everyone who's on this platform, that us ordinary citizens of the Oh, she seems to have uh, to have lost her reception. Uh, if she comes back, she will continue. Um, but Dr. Ramatuba, she, she was talking about the issue, I think, uh, of the first video, that do you feel there's need to apologize for what happened? 
you, you see, I, I still need to, to explain to the people what patient education and information sharing is all about. When you, you attend to a patient, uh, we, we, at the medical school, we had a subject called family medicine. Family medicine teaches us that whenever you are confronted with whatever, what is important is that the patient must be educated and informed because we continuously blaming patients because we, even as a clinician, you have a responsibility to educate a patient. A cardiovascular surgeon can come and tell you that if you continue with your smoking and whatever, whatever, during the ward rounds, and, 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 and you can't come and say, oh, this uh, surgeon has been humiliating me. They can tell you with your obesity, you are going to end up, you're diabetic, you're obese, you're eating a lot of fat and whatever. Sometimes you might think they're very harsh. This uh, uh, limb will be amputated. The problem becomes when people uh, take uh, videos and want to circulate them to serve uh, their own. Whereas this is an issue uh, that uh, in family medicine, we have always defined it as opportunistic health promotion. The patient was not even shown the face. The patient was not uh, identified what elective procedure was. The details of why the patient was there and whatever was not. But the education and the information sharing with the patient to say, this is how the budget works in the, in the country. So, so for me, that, that uh, information... When you, I know also, sometimes you can get to private hospital. Actually, firstly, they will tell you, show us your medical aid. If you, you don't have put up 50,000 up front, you put it, you get admitted, they operate on you. On the discharge, there will be a lady called a case manager who will come and say, tell us how you're going to settle this bill. Because we have operated you, you must settle the bill or your medical aid was able to pay uh, so much. Your medical aid pays so much, you are owing so much, pay the bill. That's not humiliating you. And they're telling you in front of even other patients in the world that you're owing so much, you must be able to pay, you can settle this and that, that's it. So, so patient information, it's, it will be reviewed in any other way, but uh, I'm still that very passionate woman who even now what I was doing was passionate. We, you know, if I had come to this patient before she was operated and say, hey, do you know how my budget ran? I get census, I get this, I get this. And then finally, this budget must uh, do that uh, and that, that. Before somebody gets operated, I will be inhuman because that patient will not even trust that that system will operate on me. This person was discharged on the way home. No, thank you very, very much, Doc. Um, are you able to uh, take a couple of questions from the floor? Is your time still okay? We, we can. All right. No, that's fine. Whilst I'm getting people um, up on the, on, the, on the mic, I wanted to ask uh, the former health minister, Dr. Motwedi, talk, talked about um, about 70, he said 70% of women giving birth at Musina Hospital are from Zimbabwe. Is this still the case or it has changed? No, no, no it, it, it has not changed because the last time we, we went there, I think it's recent now, after it's even SABC when they, now, they, they, they got out of 310, it was 320, uh, more than uh, uh, 222 were not South Africans. And, and this is the latest. So if you look at it, um, it, it will fluctuate, of course, but it's still very high. No, thank you very much. D, please go ahead. Ask your question to the MEC. Yeah, um, MEC, um, to the leadership in South Africa, through you, of course, uh, just wanted to highlight that our Minister of Health, uh, General Chuenga, is a soldier. He has never done anything about medicine in his life. He himself has flown on private for healthcare overseas. And right now, as a Minister of Health, he is denying 
better health care to his ex-wife so that she uh, maybe she's been amputated or she's going to be amputated. These are the people who are managing our health care in Zimbabwe. Now, for uh, President Munangagwa to hire a person with those credentials and make them his Minister of Health to look after health provision of 16 million Zimbabweans. Oh, here we are now. This is where we are. And until this elephant in the room, because, you know, you, you said it's an elephant. This is the elephant in the room. Until this elephant in the room is addressed honestly, and even us 16 million Zimbabweans who are suffering begin to realize that the gross negligence done by our president, Emerson Mnangagwa, in hiring a soldier to manage health services for 16 million can, 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 can we do a question, D, uh, because we're trying to get as many people as we can. Let's avoid comments, uh, because I want to protect the MEC. She can't delve into internal uh, politics of Zimbabwe. Uh, let's 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 keep it at a paper. I think, thank, thank you. It was just a comment. Hopefully she heard it. She can relay it to whoever makes decisions to engage Zimbabwe government. Thank you. I'm sure she has heard it too. Priscilla, please go ahead. Thank you, Hope. Uh, mine is um, a, a, a word of thanks uh, to Dr. Poppy. Thank you very much for your patience and for your contribution, honestly, and the sacrifice that you've, you're continuing to do and uh, extending um, uh, your services to the people of Zimbabwe. Thank you for speaking up about, uh, 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 about this issue because we have been shouting and no one has been hearing us. So I'm hoping that um, the Zimbabwean government is listening and that they will take steps to make sure that uh, they fix our health care so that uh, we can have a good relationship. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. Uh, Ziza, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Hopewell. And um, thank you, Dr. Bobby, for affording us this time this evening to, 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 to listen. Uh, to your uh, account of, of, of the position of things in, in, in South Africa at the moment with regards to healthcare, specifically uh, the Limpopo region and the effect of the Zimbabwean crisis <clears throat> on, um, on, the, on, on, on the service delivery aspect. Um, I have a comment I would like to, to, to hear back from, uh, specifically to do with the, the nature of the messaging that you uh, tried to, I don't want to say disguise, but tried, tried, tried to indicate would have been received by the patient as, as medical uh, you know, advice or post-care post advice. It was not to do, with, to, to do with anything that was directly within the patient's agency to speak to the, to, to the patient about, sorry, there's a Tobeja or Tobeya who, who's, who's not muted and they're, they're speak, um, their microphone is affecting me. No, this, can, can, yeah. you, uh, can you wrap up? The, we want yeah, so, so, okay, so the comment, uh, so, okay, so the comment about the, the nature of the message that was given to the patient is that that was not patient specific and it did not have anything to do with health care. Uh, the patient had no agency in what in the message that was being delivered. There is a message to deliver to the right people, but it was the wrong message delivered to the wrong person. My question, though, if, if, if Dr. Poppy has information on this, is what is the situation right now? What proportion of the, of the Limpopo healthcare budget is represented by United Nations funding for refugees that are recognized even by South Africa, because South Africa opened the doors and said, OK, when refugees are coming in, they're not going to be put in camps. They're going to be accommodated in normal society. So there is a recognition in the South African system of the presence of refugees in South Africa. Where's the funding there? How does that count? Because I, I, I'm not disputing that there is a pressure on the South African healthcare system. But I would like, at least in, when people are discussing funding, there are people out there who think the only funding available right now to South African healthcare delivery systems is purely from South African taxpayers and other people who are saying that's not the case. There is some other money that is coming in. It may not be shown or spoken about, but it's there. So my question is, where is that in the conversation, in the language? So it's all about language. It's not about the process or the outcome. What no, so can, 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 can you ask the question so that, because if we all stick to comments, then we won't finish. Just do the question so that she can answer you. What is the situation with regards to UN funding for refugees and healthcare as far as Limpopo budget is concerned? Thank you. Thank you. You can go ahead, Doc. Uh, thank, thank you, um, uh, very much for 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 that. Truly, truly, uh, South Africa. 
as far as I know, I, I will still go and verify because we do not have those refugees camps. I'm not sure if we are receiving such budgets. Uh, like you are saying, everyone who enters the country is interacting uh, with our citizens. In in my budget vote, I do not have those that portion which said it coming from the United Nations to cater for such. Hence, I'm saying I will still need to to verify if it does exist. But where I'm sitting, I really do not remember. I need to check with my my principal, the, the Minister of Health, uh, because South Africa is a different. A scenario we we don't have any uh, those those can and and in our province we don't have that's why when you come to the country documented or not you are integrated with all of us thank you very much uh dr bobby uh Tobejani, please ask your question Tobejani, can you hear me uh so we're going to remove him uh petros please ask your question Petros, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear please, you. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I don't have a question, actually, but I just want to thank uh, Dr. Rofi for the for highlighting these issues to us. And uh, as a Zimbabwean citizen, uh, I can actually say that uh, we, are, we are orphans. We are orphans. We are underrepresented. And I hope something can be done to change these issues. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Bobby, thank you so much for coming on board for this discussion. Uh, it was meant to be one hour, but because there were a lot of questions and some which are still to be asked in the future, we wish you well and we hope that uh, the South African government and the African National Congress uh, will be able to engage with its counterparts in Harare, the Zimbabwean government, and ZANU-PF to resolve the crisis of uh, health. Because as we can see, it's causing so many sleepless nights to so many people, and yet it's something that can be solved. But before you go, I just want to ask you one question. Um, your colleagues in Arare blame everything on sanctions. Do you have a view on this? Uh, as a South African government, which I'm part of, we will continue to condemn uh, the sanctions because they are not assisting the, the current situation in Zimbabwe. But also at the same time, if, if I'm to give my own view to say, yes, there are sanctions, but we are here, we are leading the people of Zimbabwe. And, and innocent people are now suffering. Uh, what is it that we are doing to try to mitigate some of those minor issues that I've raised, uh, issues of uh, providing uh, a, a maternity, basic maternity services? Any, any, any country, the United States, when they measure a country that has got a, a, a collapsed healthcare system, it's, it's when they look at uh, the, the, the mater, maternal uh, and, uh, and child healthcare services. If, if, if you are not having, you can't uh, look after the, 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 the pregnant women and children, it becomes a serious challenge. So for me, I'm saying, while all of us are working, supporting each other on these calls uh, for sanction, but at the same time, we should also, as the leadership that is elected by the people, to look into how best can we get this quick and address these basics uh, that the people need. For me, that is very, very important. And start looking at internally within ourselves. Do we have things that we can improve in order to, to address that? Uh, 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 you know, this, this is what I, would, I tell people that um, the, the, a, a child who's born now, who's 18, who's going to be voting uh, in, in South Africa. If, if I tell him that, no, I couldn't operate you because of the legacy of apartheid, they don't want to take it at all. No matter how factual I can be, that the legacy of apartheid is, they will tell you we need services. So that is why as government, we've got to really go beyond uh, uh, all these reasons and say, how do I, we work uh, and break our backs to make sure we deliver such services under difficult uh, situation that we find ourselves in for the sake of our people. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I think that's a very diplomatic answer to say that uh, notwithstanding sanctions, the government of Zimbabwe should be able to provide health care. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, have a good evening. I'm going to bring 
uh, the head of diplomacy, public diplomacy in the South African government, Clifton Monyela. Uh, Mr. Monyela, I've sent you a request. Could you please accept it um, so that listeners can ask a few questions uh, relating to the broader issues? I'm waiting for Mr. Monyela to accept the request. I've sent him the request and uh, I hope you'll be able to, 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 to do so. Uh, Mr. Monella, can you can you hear us at all? It seems he's having problems with our connection. So anyway, we will we will bring him up next time. We will have another space and talk about the broader issues to do with foreign policy. So thank you so much once again, um, Doctor, for all that you're doing for our people. Please don't tire. Uh, please continue looking after them. They are your orphans. One day we hope that things will be fine and we hope that uh, we'll be able to visit South Africa on holiday and you'll be able to do the same things. Uh, like the part where you said we also marry each other. So thank you so much. On that note, uh, this space has come to an end. Um, I will do another space next time um, if we manage to get Mr. Moyela to come on board so that he can answer the broader issues to do with foreign policy. Oh, yeah, this is my